oversight of the vast and clandestine world of U.S. intelligence is one of the most vital and difficult roles of Congress. At a moment of converging threats tied to the growing alignment of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, American leadership is being challenged globally like no other moment since World War II, and the U.S. intelligence community is scrambling to respond. I'm Guy Taylor, National Security Editor at The Washington Times, and for this Threat Status Influencers interview, we're joined by House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence Chairman Mike Turner, an Ohio Republican whose leadership on U.S. intelligence oversight is crucial to ensuring that the White House is effectively absorbing and acting on the most sensitive things known by the CIA, NSA, and other American spy agencies. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for joining me. Let's jump right into this. Uh, the U.S. intelligence community's most recent annual threat assessment and emphasized increasing aggression by China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, but it really highlighted China, saying China right now has the capability to alter the rules-based world order in ways that support Beijing's power and authoritarian style of governance over that of the U.S.-led system of democracy around the globe. Do you agree with that aspect of it, or is your feeling something more nuanced, or is Russia the more immediate threat? Well, I mean, each of those countries pose a significant um, solitary threat. Mm -hmm. But going all the way back to George W. Bush, you, you could identify Russia, China, North Korea, Iran as an axis of evil, as he called it. Mm. But more importantly, they are the leading authoritarian regimes mm. in the world today. Mm. And the conflict that we see that's evolving is the conflict between authoritarian regimes and democracies. We saw President Xi of China standing in Moscow with Putin, stating on what we call an open mic where he, they got caught. And he mm. said, you know, we, Putin and himself, mm. are bringing about change that hasn't happened in 100 years. Well, we know what those 100 years are. That's World War I, World War II. Mm. And that was the fight between authoritarianism and democracy. Mm. They want to replay that. They would like authoritarianism to, to win because they see democracy as a threat, not just with its uh, you know, lead in the world, but also as a threat to their regimes and a threat to their power. Um, now, Russia obviously is the most significant nuclear uh, threat. They saber rattle continuously as to both the use of nuclear weapons, their aggression against Ukraine. They have a number of times threatened to use nuclear weapons. They're continuing to invest in expanding their nuclear weapons capabilities in what many are calling the exotics, which are, are new capabilities, weapons we've never seen before, including hypersonics that they've already deployed that would be able to defeat our missile defense systems. North Korea continues to grow its nuclear weapons capability. It now has ICBM capability that can hit the United States. We have limited missile defense capability that's directed at the threat of North Korea. But in addition to just being a threat to South Korea, they see their major adversary as the United States. Iran, of course, is the destabilizer in, um, in the Middle East funding Hamas, Hezbollah, and uh, the Houthis, where we see in the Houthis from Yemen, they're threatening commercial uh, traffic shipping. And with Hezbollah and Hamas, they pose a significant threat to Israel, but also a destabilizing factor in both uh, Syria and Lebanon, really destabilizing the entire Middle East. With respect to China, you are correct. They are the most global threat, largely because they have a global footprint. You don't have many places where you're going to run into Iranian troops or North Korean troops. Similarly, Russia, although they have troops in, in Syria and in, in other places, are, are largely focused on their European adversaries. But China has worldwide uh, plans and designs. Uh, they're also enhancing their nuclear weapons capability. But that is where you see sort of the conflict between the United States and China. Is the United States doing enough to reform the posture of the biggest intelligence agencies, the CIA, the NSA, to address the, the growing China threat or the this global threat, as you framed it. The, the biggest um, gap, I think, in the evolving threat and what we're doing in the intelligence community is a funding issue. Mm. We have funded our intelligence gathering as if we're looking at how to deter or counter the growth of our adversaries in five and 10 years, whether where our adversaries are looking at that they may be in a conflict with us in five mm. to 10 years. Mm. So we need to be at the pace of understanding mm. that if we have to, to rise to the level of, of an actual conflict to push back one of these world adversaries that, that see themselves as having designs on, on destabilizing the world, uh, we're going to need and intelligence at not just a, a level of understanding what they're doing, but as an actionable level. Are we there? I mean, no, we, we're we, not. I mean, we have great intelligence. We have the best intelligence in the world. Mm. Uh, but it's still not to the level uh, where uh, we can 
effectively use it to impact the outcome. And that's what, rather than just our having an understanding of what our adversaries that are doing. That sounds like a deterrence <clears throat> issue. And, and what I hear from uh, high-level formers uh, from the intelligence community pretty regularly is that we're living in an era now of failed U.S. deterrence. How do you respond to that? Well, if you look at our major platforms, you know, our nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. our aircraft carriers, our <clears throat> space, these are all areas where our main adversaries, China mm -hmm. and Russia, and of course to some extent and North Korea and Iran, are seeking to counter our power and, and our capabilities. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have not risen to that, that we've, we have believed that, that our capabilities, um, having, having deterred our adversaries to, you know, for you know, five or more decades, um, have, um, um, have not grown in its capabilities. You brought up Russian uh, hypersonic missiles. You were at the center of really a media firestorm over calling on the White House back in February to address a, an urgent national security threat turned out to be this Russian plan of launching an anti-satellite nuclear weapon into orbit. Is that threat really right upon us? And what exactly is it and why does it matter? Just last week, the Department of Defense declassified that we are dealing with a Russian nuclear anti-satellite weapon that would be placed in orbit and that would threaten, if it was placed in low Earth orbit, all satellites within the area. So basically, all our communications, uh, all our civil, our, all of our um, commercial communications and use of space. And that low Earth orbit would be not habitable by uh, satellites, perhaps for um, over a year. Um, that threat is not just one militarily, which it is, because it impacts our whole ability uh, to operate our military, but also economically and, and civilian, commercially. What we have you know, heard that the Department of Defense is willing to discuss publicly is that this is, this is an imminent threat. This is not something that we're dealing with prospectively. This is a developing uh, capability. But here's, here's the part that's, that's, that really is essential, that we deter Russia from doing so. The moment that that satellite is in orbit, we are going to have to change every system that we have in place. Because the moment that Russia decides to put a nuclear weapon in space, we have to assume from that day forward, all of it could be turned off in an instant. And that changes our entire economy, our entire commercial, so what do our we entire need, military. What do we need to do to prevent We need that to make sure that satellite does not go up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we pushed the Department of Defense and, on, and that's yeah. why the Department of Defense has now come forward and publicly said that we're dealing with a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. and that is a, a program developed by Russia. Um, and I believe, and so do the other 26 members of my committee that voted to call on the, uh, the White House to uh, declassify this and to disclose it to our members of, of Congress, is that by at least publicly uh, challenging Russia on this, uh, that we can uh, dissuade them in the near term from putting this in space, because this is indiscriminate. China loses its, its uh, space use too. All nations lose their, their space use. This is something that really everyone should be unified except for Russia, that this should not happen. Let's talk a little bit more about Russia and the Ukraine war, but also disinformation. We, you know, you stood firmly behind the most recent uh, increase in um, U.S. aid to Ukraine, really a leader in the middle uh, in the GOP on this. But you've also said publicly that, that Russian propaganda had found its way into the halls of Congress. What did you mean by that? I, we assume that you mean there are some in the GOP that are maybe regurgitating knowingly or unknowingly Russian talking points. Right. What else can this you say? This is a relatively that? easy value proposition. Are you on the side of democracy or are you on the side of authoritarian regimes? When President Xi stood next to uh, Vladimir Putin and said, you know, we're bringing about change that hasn't occurred in 100 years, this authoritarian democracy dichotomy, um, that statement was made in context of the Ukraine conflict. President Xi went to uh, Putin to show his support for, for Russia in, in this conflict. This conflict is not about Russia and Ukraine. It's about what uh, Vladimir Putin has said is the broader conflict of the rebuilding of the Soviet Union. And for that, his designs and claims go well beyond Ukraine. 
And in his mind, and he says it frequently, he's at war with NATO and with the West and with the United States. Let's go to Iran. Are you concerned about, and what can you tell us, based on your oversight position, that Iran may already have a nuclear weapon? And if you're not, then how close are we to that, and how much attention should we be paying to it? Right. Well, you know, some of the, your question obviously is classified, but you know, on the declassified side, uh, people have u- uniformly stated that, that they do not believe that Iran is currently a nuclear power, although they are currently very close. And what they have done in enriching uranium and in uh, certainly missile technology uh, is, is an absolute threat to the United States. In fact, unfortunately, the, the last nuke deal, if you, you call it the JCPOA, yeah, sure. between the, the United States Iran and the and, uh, members of the EU, it did not restrict Iran's capability to develop missile technology. So they've continued to develop mm-hmm. missiles that can put both um, our, our troops, uh, Europe, and then ultimately the United States at risk. So it is a, it's a great danger uh, for them to be a nuclear power, not just because of the conflicts in the Middle East, not just because they're the lead sponsor of terrorism. And obviously a nation that sponsors terrorism, having a nuclear weapon is likely mm-hmm. to put one in the hands of, of terrorists. But also you have the direct threat to Israel. I mean, they just sent 300 missiles you know, raining down over Israel. And if one, just one of those had been nuclear, uh, we would have uh, had substantial loss in, in Israel. So what's the next step? What should the U.S. policy be to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? Well, both um, President Biden and Trump uh, absolutely stated that uh, they, neither one of them would allow Iran to become a nuclear state. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that they, that will be reaffirmed during this election process. And that means that military options are on the table, that if Iran would get to that step <clears throat> where they had sufficient material to make a nuclear weapon or were beginning the process of weaponization of the, what they've, they've put through the enrichment process, uh, you would find, I believe, both Israel and the United States joining together uh, with military action to ensure that that, that final step isn't taken. Last question on FISA and the uh, the recent reauthorization and reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Section 702. Uh, you played a pretty big role in getting that through, and there are critics that say not enough is done to protect Americans from getting caught up in the spying, that there, there are some little warrant-type expansions for the FBI if they were going to be looking at uh, American communications that were caught up while looking at a foreign target. How do you respond to that? Well, most of this is misunderstanding. The bill, the law itself already prevents and prohibits um, targeting or spying on United States citizens or Americans or people who are in, located in the United States. So frequently, the media incorrectly states that this is some um, mass warrantless spying on Americans. And, and this is not. The statute itself specifically prohibits uh, any surveillance of, of people, Americans located in the United States. And it is court supervised and approved. The people that by statute um, that there is surveillance are foreigners abroad, a limited n- number. They have to be actually represent a national security threat. There are about 250,000 that are put through a court process uh, it's where, very secretive court process in the Well, FISA all court. warrant processes are secretive. Right, there is right. no portion in our courts anywhere mm-hmm. where anyone goes but to you get feel a as warrant. Intel committee chairman, you have these got are foreigners oversight. located abroad. Right. They are not Americans. Even for Americans, where a court process uh, seeks to surveillance on them if they're cr- criminals or they're engaged engaged in let's say drug activity, that warrant process is secretive. Our courts are not open because obviously you don't want people who are involved in criminal activity. Right. To be aware that they're going to be under surveillance. This has nothing to do with domestic uh, activities. This is totally foreigners located abroad, about 250,000. Mm. One of which, of course, is going to be the head of Hamas, the head of Hezbollah, the head of ISIS. And if there are Americans that correspond with the head of Hamas, the head of ISIS, or the head of Hezbollah, um, obviously, because we're spying on these individuals, their communications are going to be caught up in that. Mm. There should not be a warrant to look at Hamas's, Hezbollah's, mm-hmm. or ISIS's mm-hmm. uh, communications, regardless of if American decides that they want to communicate with these known terrorist organizations. Mm-hmm. Those that claim that we should have to get a warrant to look at data we've already collected on our that have already been under a court-supervised process as a significant national security threat, one, are putting in a, a cumbersome process to be able to keep Americans safe. But secondly, you'd have no real ability to get that, um, 
that warrant and you would be in a process where you would be unable to read Americans' communications with Hamas, Hezbollah, or ISIS. Now, by the way, Americans, it means people located in the United States, mm -hmm. not citizens. Mm -hmm. Just anybody mm -hmm. located in the United States. Including the, members and, of Congress. And the, and, the, and the issue here is if somebody sends an, an, a, um, an email to Hezbollah saying, hey, thank you for the bomb making classes, mm -hmm. um, you and your neighbors are going to want us to know that because that's how we keep Americans safe. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner, so informative, so insightful. Thank you so much for joining Thanks me for, for me. this edition of the Threat Status Influencer Series. I'm Guy Taylor. Until next time.